welcome back to Dream It, Build It, Make It, a series where we're talking to some of the people behind the best customer experiences. My name is Michael Heward. I'm the manager of content marketing here at Iterable, and I am joined today by two fantastic members of HoneyBook, Loren Elia and Maylee Musson. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to talk to you both today. I think we're going to have a great conversation. Before we dive in, I was hoping you could just tell my son, me and a little bit of uh, the audience a little bit about yourself and what you're doing at HoneyBook. Uh, Lorraine, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am the director of product marketing here at HoneyBook. Um, so product marketing here uh, basically does three things. We kind of understand our users, we understand our product, we understand our market. And then kind of like marry the three, make sure that the product team understands the user, the product team understands the market. And then we also communicate back with the user so the user understands the product and is able to extract value from the product. Um, so that's in a very short and succinct way uh, what we do here at HoneyBook as part of the product marketing team and Meili makes tell you a bit more of what she does, but she is within the product marketing team because of how we view the customer lifecycle as part of this ecosystem that I just mentioned. Exactly. So my role as lifecycle marketing manager kind of encompasses everything we're on just outlined um, and takes our customers from the advocacy stage of their journey all the way or from the awareness stage all the way to the advocacy stage and ensures that they're you know, constantly feeling empowered to use the product and really have easy access to all of the knowledge that will make their lives easier using HoneyBook and guide them along that journey. Very cool. I, I feel like it's uh, pretty rare to see lifecycle marketing under product marketing. Uh, it's an interesting way to, to view the customer uh, interaction with the company. It's very cool. Um, so I like to start these out um, by kind of pulling it back away from the industry, away from the um, customer experience and just talk about you as a consumer. So I'm curious, uh, Amelia, we can start with you on this one. What, what's a good a customer experience to you? Like what are some features of a brand experience? Maybe a brand, you have an example of uh, that you just think like they're, they're crushing it. Like what, what's a good experience for you? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me as a consumer, that's also a marketer, your mind automatically goes to kind of this like all-knowing, omni-channel, really highly personalized, ridiculous experience expectation. But in practice, I think some of the simpler things of just having a really personalized, cohesive experience can sometimes be the most impactful. And so for me, just kind of thinking through this, brands that make really strong recommendations on product based on your browsing behavior and the fact that you know kind of they have access to that data that they're leveraging it in a way that is clever and makes things easier for you um, is something that i enjoy as a consumer i think as far as examples you know sephora has great emails they really nail that personalization piece as well as kind of the timing so if you're on there browsing they'll show you that product and they'll show you a bunch of related products and really kind of seize the moment on that recency factor and kind of drive you along um, keeping you engaged. Um, and then another one that came up when Loren and I have been talking about this was just the Kindle app of that really simple cohesion of just being able to read a book on my Kindle and then open it up on my phone later and have it automatically be exactly where I left off is something that's really special. And I think for customers overall, you know, being able to pick up right where you left off and having it be easy on you as a consumer is something that's really, really important. Yeah, definitely. I'm not a I'm not a avid user of Sephora, but I have heard that their experience is really good. Um, and I, I agree with you as a marketer. You look at these experiences and you're nitpicking, but if you if you don't notice it, I think that's a sign of a great experience. Uh, Lorraine, what about you? Yeah, I think um, I'm on the same same boat with Meili. I mean, for me, it's like it's I kind of assume that companies have a lot of information about me, right? I know as a marketer that they are following me across the web, they are creating incredibly robust databases. And so for me, I want these brands to actually use that information to market to me in a relevant way, right? So 
Um, another example that we were talking about, um, Meili and I, the other day is um, actually Apple Maps, mm. which has been a surprise to me because I was a avid Google Maps user, but the last couple of weeks or so I've started using Apple Maps and I have found it to be really well integrated. Like they know where I live, even though I never told them where I live, but I don't know, I guess they know where my phone is most of the time and assume that's where I live, right? And so when I tell uh, Siri, hey, like map me home, they know where home is and they just map me home. So that those kind of like really integrated experiences where they are using the information they have about me to provide me a better experience is kind of like what I really admire uh, from some brands. That's fascinating. I haven't used Apple Maps in a long time. I feel like maybe I'll check it out now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so bringing it to what you're doing at HoneyBook, HoneyBook um, you're helping entrepreneurs kind of build their brand, build their um, company. Uh, so at the start of the pandemic, there were a lot of layoffs around the country. Um, people lost their jobs, unfortunately, and it led to new freelancers, new people, new small business owners kind of taking advantage to like build a brand on their own passion. Um, so in that process, HoneyBook opened up to new verticals and lowered your prices. How did this pivot really impact the marketing team um, in, in particular and the way you communicated, communicated, I can't say the word communicated for some reason, uh, how you communicated with your customers? Yeah, maybe I can start um, with this one. So as you mentioned, just a brief kind of summary of what HoneyBook does. Um, HoneyBook is a, a business management tool that helps small business owners manage their process from first inquiry to final payment. So everything, including invoicing, contracting, payments, brochures, questionnaires, anything that they need to move those leads through the funnel and convert those client, uh, clients into business. Um, before the pandemic, we were uh, strongly focused on the event industry. But with the pandemic and all events shutting down, this kind of became, you know, a, a, a potentially life-threatening event for HoneyBook, right? Uh, but I, I think what was, I think, very, or something that I really admire about our leadership team is that they were able to focus us in a way that really helped us come out of this on the other side much stronger than we were before. Um, and a couple of things they did. First of all, it was all about um, focusing on helping our members get through this. And so we created a bunch of content, product features, everything we needed to help them get through this and be able to sustain their businesses. Um, as part of that, we also kind of thought about our pricing and uh, starting offering our product at $1 a month for their first six months. What this enabled us is basically A, like get all these people to try the product and really realize how helpful it was for them. And even though they started at a dollar after the six months, they were actually upgrading to our $40 or $39 now uh, plan, like a full price plan, because they were able to realize the value and the positive ROI that having our tool made in their business. What that also enabled us, or I think this, the second part of what our leadership team did very well, I, I think in my opinion, is that they started, uh, we started focusing on expanding to other verticals, right? And so web designers, business consultants, marketing consultants, and now we have a very diverse user base that ranges from doulas to pet sitters. Uh, because basically anyone that is a small business that needs to invoice someone can benefit from our product. Um, and so I think that kind of like the combination of all these things really help us open new opportunities and, and expand into new markets. And uh, we're doing great. We more than doubled our uh, user base last year, actually, and we just raised a series D, uh, we're valued at a billion dollars. So I think we might have done something right, I guess. <laughs> yeah, 
team so <laughs> uh was there anything in particular that you guys that you had to do to break into these new verticals like how, how did that that shift happen maybe maybe you want to speak to this yeah, at the absolutely i think for us um something that was kind of striking was that a lot of the use cases for these business verticals are strikingly similar and as lauren mentioned you wouldn't expect that for a doula and a dog walker but kind of from our research and exploring kind of the client process of our members, we've been able to really hone in on a few of these key milestones that are relevant across the board. And so I think for kind of learnings that we didn't necessarily anticipate from the pandemic, that was definitely one of them. Um, but we're continuing to test and learn new things about all of these verticals and what's most relevant to them, kind of what that process looks like and how we can serve them content at the right time. Um, because obviously there are always going to be differences, but what was more surprising from a learning perspective was how we were able to really map some of the ways that we treat, you know, our core verticals that we had previously into our newly expanded verticals. That's very interesting. I, I feel for your uh, content team and the, the new possibilities of stories I could tell. Um, so Lauren, you, you, you mentioned this, you brought up your new series of uh, funding. Congrats, by the way, that's amazing. Um, and it's the, the extremely rapid growth. Like that's, that's some insane growth. How, how have you scaled? Like how has the, the marketing team scaled uh, maybe like internally and just externally, like maintaining a close relationship with these entrepreneurs? Yeah, so we're hiring for all the roles. <laughs> Shameless plug here. Um, but yeah, so we're scaling our marketing team um, a lot. Uh, but I, I guess we have also done a lot of work in optimizing our programs. Um, so Meili can tell you more about this and I, I'll actually let her tell you about this, but she has implemented a few really interesting uh, life cycle nurtures that uh, has really helped us kind of like educate our users at scale and drive adoption of our features, but mainly why don't you like, tell them more? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I think really, I know everyone says this and it comes off kind of cheesy and disingenuous sometimes, but our customers really are at the core of everything we do of their small business is what is able to drive our business. And so for us really understanding all of the use cases that they present is super critical and as Lauren mentioned, there's a lot of work that happens to really ensure that on their life cycle journey, they're learning things at the right time in a way that's not overwhelming and a way that they can immediately apply and feel really empowered by it instead of overwhelmed by it because with an all-in-one tool, you know, you do run that risk of throwing everything in the kitchen sink at someone. Um, so I think for us, that's something that's very important within the life cycle nurtures and especially as we introduce these new verticals and are learning about them um, we want it to be a two-way street so we have a lot of education that we provide them but we also keep a really close ear into our community and so we have beta groups we have our facebook group we have open channels of communication with our really fabulous member experience team and we're always you know aggregating that feedback, ensuring that we can keep building product features that are relevant to them, especially as we introduce new verticals and keep the product growing with our users um, and keep ensuring that we address those needs as we you know, work together with members to learn about them. Yeah, and just to, add to what Meili was just saying, I think one of the things that we have been doing pretty well is closely collaborating with our customer success and as our support teams together with our, our life cycle and in product marketing uh, efforts. And so we actually developed a few programs last year that have proven pretty successful for us. Um, the first one we call Jab Cross Hook, um, inspired from boxing. Uh, but it's basically like a three-prong approach where it starts with, with our support team. So um, it starts with a someone chatting in with a question around one of our features. Our support team tags that, a, that user as having a question around that feature. And then we follow up with an email, a dedicated and personalized email 
where we explain and provide more education and more information around that feature. And then after that, we follow up again through our customer success team if they are within the, that segment that our customer success team serves, so high value customers. Um, so then they follow up with a call to the user to further explain how to use or, or adopt that feature. So it has been very, very successful. The second program that we implemented that has actually also been super uh, successful is one that we call micro targeting. And micro targeting has, again, two, two stages, I would say. So basically, we are listening or uh, tracking what users are doing within our product. And we have been able to identify actions where the next logical step would be to use one certain feature or another feature of our product. And so what we're doing is that when we identify that the user has done this action, we have an in-product pop-up message, and then we follow up with an email. Um, so it's kind of like that, two, again, two-prong approach where we provide a lot of information in the email in a very short and direct call to action with the product in-product in notification. So these two uh, programs have really helped us scale and I guess be more uh, intentional about the communications that we have out there for our users. That's awesome. It, it's about, it sounds like it's value consulting uh, more than really anything else like that. Amelia, you mentioned it, the education aspect of it. Uh, there's so much that goes into starting your own business. So I imagine you get a lot of overwhelmed people asking questions. <laughs> yeah, and so one thing that we wanna be super careful about is not overwhelming them, right, with information. And as I mentioned, being very intentional about what information we share when, because otherwise people just, if you, talk, if you try to tell someone everything, they will learn nothing. And so we are very intentional about only saying one thing at a time, having a really, you know, um, concise messaging, really clear call to actions so that we don't try to teach everything at the same time and then kind of like slowly build on that education and that uh, product knowledge. So when someone signs up, do they have, um, well, when you're describing this, it sounds like that's a pretty cohesive experience for the customer as they're trying to learn things. But when they're using the product, um, like there's invoicing, payment processing, client booking, like the, you name it. Um, how does the, the product itself uh, become a little bit more cohesive and like the experience of using it uh, for any, like a new customer, for example? Um, yeah, so I think um, we are uh, constantly evolving or iterating on our onboarding experience. And I think our onboarding experience actually follows same, some many of the same principles of just get you to do one thing first, right? The first thing we try to get you to do is upload your brand and your logo, which is easy, familiar, do that. And after that, we kind of like introduce you to the invoice. And after that, we like introduce you to other features, uh, we do uh, try to have the product be as educational as possible and have as much information available to you within that context. Uh, but we do supplement it with, again, some, you know, CSM touches, uh, which every person that signs up with HoneyBook gets their account built by us. So they sent us their invoices, their contracts, et cetera. And we contract that out and we build your account for you. And then uh, most businesses that are kind of like a full-time business owners or businesses also get a customer success person that does a one-on-one -on -one kind of onboarding with you and helps you translate your business into HoneyBook. Um, so I think I, I would say it's a combination of good like product education and good messaging within the product and then also human touch yeah that makes sense um and so shifting gears a little bit uh diversity and inclusion and kind of uh, social issues have been a big they've had a, a big swell of interest and in conversation in the past year and so in 2019 even before all this started uh honeybook released a study that found female freelancers make 26 percent less Per project, the male freelancers. So I'm just curious. That's something that a lot of people 
probably don't know. Like that it's just something that you don't realize as you're going into this. So um, have you done any, done any sort of follow-up to this? And so also what are some other trends maybe in the SMB solopreneur community that people might not be aware of that they should be aware of as they're maybe interacting with these smaller businesses? Yeah, absolutely. And so that 2019 study was actually a follow-up study to a gender pay gap study we conducted in 2017. Um, and so kind of on the exciting front, we were able to see that gap closing a little bit, but it's still quite prevalent. And essentially, you know, female freelancers are doing more projects um, and being paid less on a per project basis than male freelancers based on all of our findings. Um, and so we had a lot of really fascinating takeaways from that study, um, but a lot of it was around just the, the vastness of the solopreneur kind of space. And I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, how many solopreneurs there are and kind of what needs they have. And so we, you know, as HoneyBook kind of believe in supporting this market overall with being able to do what you love, work on your own time, but also realize that, you know, there are a lot of unique hardships that come with that. And so this study was illuminating in um, a lot of challenges that parents face around comfort for them being able to strike that work-life balance and their comfort level with feeling like they can speak about that with their clients and even just say like, I'm a parent, that there are concerns that may scare, you know, prospective clients off. Um, but we've also had a lot of findings around kind of the needs that these freelancers have where access to capital, access to insurance, um, access to healthcare are all challenges that they face. Um, and, you know, it's a substantial amount of people who are being these awesome, brave solopreneurs and really trying to make that life happen for themselves. Um, and so as HoneyBook, obviously our primary goals are to leverage any of that information to really support them um, as we develop our own product. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I've tried freelancing before and it, it's a it's a hell of a thing. I, I, you mentioned bravery and it really takes a lot of bravery and um, I hope these gaps can continue to close and equity comes across a little bit easier. Um, so to round this out, I like to ask my guests, um, looking forward, everyone is always kind of looking at the future. Uh, are there any gaps that you see or opportunities you could you could rephrase it to be opportunities uh, in the customer experience um, as like the digital transformation has taken place? Uh, where, where are some opportunities that you see, whether whether it's with funny HoneyBook, um, not funny, but HoneyBook uh, and uh, or elsewhere, just in general with the customer experience? Mm -hmm. I think kind of bringing it back to the very top and kind of your first question of what do you enjoy as a customer? I mean, I think for us, the cohesive cross-channel, highly personalized experiences are always that kind of North Star that guides us. And, you know, to all of the marketing efforts that we've put forth, you know, both pre and post-purchase for really being able to educate members and provide them the right message at the right time, you know, there's always going to be work to be done there. And I think on the broader note of the digital transformation and ways that we can tie together everything that we know about customers to make their journey really seamless. Um, you know, it's a lot more challenging in practice than it is in theory. And so I think for us, just kind of leveraging any tools and any data at our disposal to really ensure that we're getting closer to that North Star is something really important. Um, and a lot of that is kind of what we're tackling now and continuing to optimize on now with kind of the consultative approach that Loren addressed with our job cross hook, with our micro-targeting initiatives, being able to really understand what those life cycle milestones look like for our customers and leverage our research teams, our product teams, you know, every, every bit of information we can get our hands on to really do that successfully um, and to keep expanding to be able to do it, you know, across channels in an even more cohesive way because I'm sure you know from being in the marketing world, it's, it's hard to nail it. And that's something that we'll, we'll be working on probably for a long time and just continuing to get better at. 
Yeah, and on the other side of the equation for us as well, for our members, our users, we are trying to also bring some of that cohesive client experience and make it accessible to them because of course we have all these tools and all these you know resources and people that can help us get there but our users are solopreneurs or small business owners and they don't maybe have access to the same things so what we are trying to do is is provide them uh, with ways in which they can create that cohesive client experience and so a lot of the of the product development that is happening right now at honeybook is how are we going to enable these people to be able to make it a very smooth experience for their clients where like they, they submit an inquiry and they can smoothly and easily and cohesively get to the payment stage uh, without any, with the minimum amount of back and forth and without kind of information dropping um, alongside the process. So that's where we're focused currently. Gotcha. Well, I'm excited. To, oh, getting in delivery. Uh, well, I'm excited. To, excited to see how it all progresses. Uh, you guys, are, you're doing great work over there, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. I know there's a, a lot going on. You're growing fast, and you, you're building a team. So, uh, is there any way that anyone can reach out to you if they have any questions about either working with you, like you said, you're hiring, or with uh, Honeybook in general? Yeah, I think you can find us in LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is. Lauren Elia. Yep, exactly. We are hiring. So please find us on LinkedIn, um, Mainly Musson. And yeah, thank you so much for having us, Michael. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Apologies about the delivery. Um, but yes, I will put those links in the bio below. Um, everyone that has watched before, you know the deal, like subscribe, all those things. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. This was so much fun.